and they knew it was going to be hard. Coolidge was fairly popular. He had become president when Warren Harding keeled over and died in office. As president, Coolidge was pretty widely liked, and the Democrats knew that Coolidge was going to be hard to beat in 1924. But the Democrats headed into their convention that year in the hot summer of 1924. They had a couple of good candidates. They chose their nominees not in a primary process so much as just at the convention in New York City the summer of 1924. One was a Democrat, Al Smith, governor of New York at the time. His chief rival, William Gibbs McAdoo. Uh, McAdoo was originally from Tennessee in the Woodrow Wilson administration. McAdoo was Secretary of the Treasury. He pulled off the major coup of marrying President Wilson's daughter while Wilson was president and while McAdoo was serving as Secretary of the Treasury. He was a very high profile Secretary of the Treasury. He is a senator. He's very rich. He'd been the vice chairman of the Democratic Party. 1920, they very nearly picked McAdoo. Al Smith had a pretty good shot, but William McAdoo was in really good stead as well. McAdoo had one ace in the hole, which is that he also had the Klan. Ku Klux Klan was absolutely ascendant. The racist seminal film, Birth of a Nation, that glorified the Klan, that film had come out in 1915 and swept the nation. It had helped revivify the Klan from its old days. Klan got even more wind in their sails when they became one of the major powers pushing for prohibition. Ban alcohol as a country? Really? We decided that? And by the time the Democratic Party was making this hard choice, the Klan thought it should have a say as to who the Democratic Party would pick for their presidential nominee that year. For the Klan, that was a really easy pick because Al Smith was a Catholic. The Klan went all in for William Gibbs McAdoo. An anti-McAdoo delegate from Alabama, of all places, put forward a plank for the party platform that year that would have condemned the Klan. The fight over whether or not to approve that anti-Klan plank absolutely convulsed the convention that summer. They were literally fighting in the aisles. They at one point called in a thousand policemen. Ultimately, it was voted down by one vote. As you can see, it's the Baltimore Sun. Bedlam over the Klan when the plank lost. 20,000 masked, hooded Klansmen rallied across the Hudson River in New Jersey to mark the moment. They didn't think they'd be able to rally in New York City. They had an effigy of New York Governor Al Smith. But then the convention had to move on to picking its nominee. Are you going to pick the Klan candidate who wouldn't denounce them, who wouldn't say a word against them? Or are you going to pick the Catholic guy? In 1924, they couldn't, Bridget. They, they started balloting. They started taking votes on who the delegates wanted to be their nominee. In the July heat in Madison Square Garden, that thing went on for 16 days and no air conditioning and the fights and the cops. And they kept going. Ultimately went to 103 ballots. A record. And in the end, they couldn't decide. They picked neither. They picked some other guy named John Davis, who nobody knew and basically had no constituency. They ran this guy, John Davis, half-heartedly. He got trounced. Coolidge was sworn in in March of 1925. And the Klan, having flexed its muscles, but they decided that once Coolidge was in there, it was time for them to make another show of political power. They didn't just want to make it within one political party. This time they wanted to flex their muscles on the national stage. August 1925, and those aren't like choir robes, down Pennsylvania Avenue. And then a year later, they decided to come back and do it again, even bigger. September 1926, the Ku Klux Klan held what they called their, their national conclave in Washington, D.C., 50,000 through Washington, D.C. 1927, there was a Klan rally and march in New York City. It started off with a group of fascists, it's black shirts, clashed with New York City police, and then that melee was joined by a thousand Klansmen who turned out in New York, in Queens. The flyers that the Klan was distributing at the time, explaining why they were marching, the headline on the flyer said, Americans assaulted by Roman Catholic police of New York City. Nobody was killed. The police commissioner at the time made a point of telling the public that this was kind of a landmark moment for the Klan in New York City. It's not that he didn't know that the Klan was active in New York City. It's just that New York City had never before seen a thousand Klansmen turn out in the streets in robes and masks. And there were seven men who were arrested at that Klan march in New York. One of them was Fred Trump, father of Donald Trump. Donald Trump has previously responded by saying it never happened. Contemporaneous news coverage that both describes and shows pictures of that mass 
Klan march. His father's name does show up as one of the arrestees from that march. But it's not ancient history. It's not even ancient family history. Their goals have never been to just exist on the fringe as some sort of kooky throwback peanut gallery for parolees, right? Their goals and their expectations have always been that they should exert real mainstream political power, that they should get to pick the president. We don't know what to expect from those groups going forward now that it's a modern president who appears to be picking them. When you say the alt-right, define alt-right to me. What about the alt-left? Not all of those people were neo-Nazis, believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists by any stretch. You take a look the night before, they were there to protest the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue. You had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. There were people in that rally, and I looked the night before, they were people protesting very quietly. A lot of people in that group that were there to innocently protest and very legally protest. And some White House officials tried to distance themselves from the president's remarks. But there was no expectation among the White House staff that the president was going to make remarks on this. As much as some White House official might want us to believe that, it's clear that that account is not true. The Associated Press caught this great high-resolution shot of the president folding up notes. The president was not there to talk about infrastructure today. And at some point, it's going to have to stop being treated as a surprise. What he is building back up is something that was a long-standing force for political power and terror that we have lived through before. And it waxes and wanes, but it has never really gone away. When someone asserts that the Holocaust never took place, then I don't believe that person ever deserves one iota of public trust. And when someone has so recently endorsed Nazism, uh, it is inconceivable that such a person can legitimately aspire uh, to leadership. And that's one way to do it. Today we saw a very different approach.